If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. You can record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. You can make money right from your podcast with no minimum listeners. It's everything you need to make a podcast right in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the Be the Adult podcast. Be the Adult is a nonprofit organization that provides blueprints for calm and effective parenting so that children can grow into their best selves. Because ultimately, we aren't raising children. We are raising little people who will one day be adults. And this week's topic is behave gently. Now, if you're following along in our book with us, the why, why is this concept important? It teaches the child that they deserve tender physical treatment from everyone in life and that they should behave this way with others as well. And today we're going to discuss the how and why it's so important with our guests. Yes. Hey, Marcel. I am so excited to introduce Megan Boyd, um, the director of the new Hanover County Resiliency Task Force. I'm so excited. I know I already said that, but <laughs> I am happy you are with us. Um, Mevin is a licensed clinical social worker who has served in um, a variety of nonprofits in town, the uh, Wilmington Domestic Violence Shelter, to the Children's Museum, Cameron Art Museum, Smart Start. And I was told that her work with Smart Start as family services manager brought her awareness to the role toxic stress plays in preventing children from reaching their full potential. So um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to be here too. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, I know you are so well informed in what is happening in New Hanover County. Um, And you bring so many great thinkers' minds together to help support the kids in our community. So I appreciate your hard work. And I wanted to just jump right in, if that's okay, and start talking about trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, so like you had said, so we all kind of have a common language. Um, If you wouldn't mind defining trauma for all of us, that would be great. Sure, and it's it's nice to have this opportunity to share this definition because I think we use the word trauma a lot. We use the word stress a lot. We use the term toxic stress. You know, there's a lot of words um, that um, the community is using about some of the the same things. And at the task force has decided to um, to define. Um, trauma using the SAMHSA definition, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency. It's a federal agency. And I'm going to read that definition to you. Um, This comes from a publication that they had in uh, 2014. So their definition of trauma is is this. uh, Individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as a, as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. That's a long definition, but I think one of some of the key words from that is that. These are things that happen that the the individual experiences it in harmful as harmful or life threatening. Not everybody is affected the same way by certain things that happen to them. So, for example, um, one of us might be um, bit by a dog and we're able to shake that off. And, and, have, and love being around dogs. But another person might be bitten by a dog and for the rest of their life, they're terrified by dogs. It doesn't mean that one or the other of those people um, had a bad reaction or, or it was their fault that they 
had a, dif- a different kind of reaction. It's just that that it's it's their prerogative to define that something was traumatic to them, and and we we shouldn't minimize that trauma that happens to people. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's someone's perception. If they perceive something as traumatic then that is really the important detail there. Um, Can I just add one word when you listed all the words that we're using? Um, Because I hear trigger all the time, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially Mm -hmm. these days, I hear triggers. Um, I'm being triggered, I'm being triggered. And so Mm -hmm. to your point is, you know, my trauma might be triggered by my every moment I've had up until this moment. <laughs> so right. you like unique to me. Exactly. That- and it could be a smell, something that you don't even realize is associated with that trauma. Or it, it could be a sound that you heard, or it could be the color of someone's shirt that to, to those of us who didn't experience that individual's trauma, it might not make sense to us. But to that person, that trauma is trauma. And um, part of the work of the task force is to teach and educate the community about how trauma shows up. Beautiful. And so we need to remember that too with our children, that what they're perceiving as a traumatic event is more often than not, not something that we might perceive as a traumatic event in the moment. Um, Mm -hmm. So what everyone brings to the moment is is very different. Yeah. So how pervasive is trauma? Um, Well, it's, it's more pervasive, I think, than most folks realize. And um, the, the data, or or we use a lot, the ACEs study, and I don't know how much of the ACEs study you all have talked about on this podcast. Um, but let me, if I could just give a little background on, on that study, it's it's sometimes referred to as the most important study that nobody's ever heard of. Let me tell you a little bit about the ACEs study. Um, it was done in the mid '90s by two doctors, Dr. Anda and Dr. Folletti. Um, they were from the CDC and from Kaiser Health in San Diego, and they studied over 17,000 individuals. Wow. That. Um, uh, healthcare through their employers. So they were primarily white, middle class, college educated um, individuals. And they asked them 10 questions, 10 yes or no questions. And they all started off with before the age of 18, did you? And, and all the questions, you know, had to do with domestic violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, substance abuse in the home. Um, What am I forgetting? Uh, Someone in the home was incarcerated and um, someone in the home with um, mental health issues. And for every time someone answered yes to that question, that gave them a score of one, one more. So your score could be anywhere from zero to 10. And what they found was that two out of three respondents had at least one ace. So, you know, 67% of people had at least one. And remember that definition of trauma, it's how you perceived it, right? So we, we can't judge, well, that's not physical abuse or um, that doesn't count as um, someone with mental health issues. It's To the person who experienced it, they perceived it as they experienced that trauma. And so what the doctors did was to say that for, they compared those ACE scores to health outcomes. Every health outcome you can imagine. So anywhere from obesity to heart disease, to cancer, to um, substance abuse, to high blood pressure, um, and for every single health outcome that they studied, the the outcomes of that were worse for people who had higher ACE scores. And it kind of makes sense for us when we're talking about things like substance abuse. It's like, well, of course, if you had a really bad childhood, your chances of 
abusing substances seems like it would be more. But I think it was a real surprise to people um, that not only were they surprised how much trauma there was, but they were surprised at that things like cancer and heart disease were affected by the trauma that people experienced in childhood. Wow. Wow. That's, that's profound and such a large study too. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. Can I ask a layman's question? Is it, would it be a fair statement to say that most people are walking around with trauma, with some form of childhood trauma? Well, I would say that the majority of people are. So if, especially if you're thinking about who this study was, right? So um, you, we typically don't think of white middle-class people as having a lot of trauma. Well, it, that was proven wrong with this study. And so those communities who live also in um, communities where there's a lot of poverty, where there's a lot of violence, um, that those actually, there's been a, a whole new look to, to say, well, it's not just the trauma that happens in a family unit that, so a- ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And the, the group, the um, communities that are working on this have also said there's also adverse community environments. That's another ACE. Things like lack of affordable housing, lack of um, places to buy healthy food, uh, racism, um, you know, all of those things create the soil of a community where this trauma lives and exacerbate those trauma experiences of childhood or can make um, childhood trauma more likely to happen. If you have parents who have extreme levels of stress, I don't know where we're going to live tomorrow. I don't know how we're going to eat tonight. um, You know, those kinds of stresses cause us to have less patience with children, cause us to have um, less ability to handle typical child development, typical things that happen in families. So we feel like... um, when we're talking about trauma, it's not just those 10 things that that first ACE study um, highlighted, that it's actually lots of different things that cause trauma. And it's very, very common to your question, Marisol. Yeah. And some people, well, when I use the word trauma, think just the kind of the big T, um, maybe the 10 things that you're talking about or in their mind, what, what constitutes trauma. But there's also, I'm trying to remember the practitioner that, that talks about the, the, or the expert, trauma expert, um, might be James Gordon, I'm trying to remember, talks about big T's and little T's, um, and that there's no hierarchy of suffering of trauma, that they're, that they're all traumatic. Um, so, so I think when we include um, all, all of the smaller T's, not to say that they're not as significant, but more in people's perception. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I learned that it personally in therapy for myself, because I just assumed, I had always thought that either my trauma wasn't as big as other people's trauma, or my trauma was much bigger than other people's trauma, depending on what they were sharing. And then I had, I think I when I learned about the physical aspects of trauma, like how it was physically, physically affected a person, mm-hmm. then I understood the concept that, oh, all trauma is kind of equal. I mean, I I don't want to say it's all equal. I'm not a technician. You lovely ladies are, so correct me if I'm wrong. But that's where I got that concept that um, just something that affected me in my childhood, you know, would have no point of reference for someone else. And vice versa, as a parent, I've learned that you know, I, I had to overcome minimizing my children's trauma um, because I was comparing it to my own. So as parents, you know, it's, it was, um, it's, let me reframe it. Be the adult, I think, is very passionate about this topic because we realize that we're all kind of walking around traumatized, raising traumatized kids. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The environment that we're in, and COVID, and all, and all of the other 
traumas, right? So the, the complex trauma, multiple traumas that, that we're all collectively in right now. So um, is uh, hard as I take a deep breath. So um, yeah, so would you mind speaking a little bit to the impact? I know we could probably talk for, for 20 more years <laughs> about the impact that trauma has on individuals, um, parents and children, right? family, system, society, just whatever some points you think might be important to address with that. Sure. So, you know, in that definition that I read, um, I, I sort of, I read off different places where it can affect you, right? So it, um, it can show up in um, relationships, you know, um, as, as children or as adults, um, a lack of trust or, you um, a lack of um, ability to connect because um, the, that trauma part of our brain that, that makes us when we're, when we feel unsafe and when you talk about being triggered, right? So I, um, when I, I'll just use an example of um, just a few years ago, I broke my wrist um, and I'm very, simple little path I slipped and fell and a a year or two after that I went to that same spot Um, it was right off the parking lot and I did not want to go walk on that path again it was very um, you know it it would make no sense that I would fall again and break my wrist again but my trauma brain at that moment was firing danger danger my my brain remembered that spot don't go down there right so if if we bring those that's a very simple not really a, a trauma experience but it was something that for me made me afraid so if you think about someone who's been harmed um in a certain part of the house or uh, in the bathtub or someone who's been um, harmed um, emotionally in a certain classroom, that that our trauma brains work the same way. I don't want to go there. I'm on high alert. So something really little could happen and I could just react really strong or in a way that seems illogical to those of us who haven't experienced that trauma, but um, it can affect someone's learning abilities, someone's ability to connect with other human beings, someone's ability to play, take a joke, someone's ability to um, love another unconditionally. It it can have just lifelong um, significant impacts. And we can overcome those traumas um, by learning resilience skills and ways to calm our trauma brain. And that's some of the work that the task force is doing. Uh, So it's not a hopeless situation, but those of us who work with children and families, I think need to always be cognizant of how much trauma there is. And when someone reacts or behaves in a way that seems illogical to us, Rather than saying, what is wrong with you? We want to switch the way our community thinks and and us, too, as we deal with um, families who've been through trauma, to say instead, what happened to you? Mm. Or even um, another, even farther along that that path might be, what's right with you? Mm. You know, so... Going from strong to what happened to what's right. Mm. I love I love that language. Um, it, it's interesting because I was just thinking about we're talking about how difficult this must be, even with the trauma that we're aware of, and then so many of us have been through trauma that we're that we're unaware of, mm-hmm. um, which is which is you know guiding us on our path too. I'm sorry, Marisol. Do you want to say something? Well, I was just going to ask, I mean, I was going to also say I love the words that she used. Um, The first phrasing of uh, what's, you know, what happened to you kind of hit me in the gut because I was kind of, oof. but then I I also love the way she reframed that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I guess I have two questions 
to offer our audience like specific assistance with this topic. Um, so I'm coming from the perspective of a, of a parent and saying, you know, I, I got upset. I, some trauma was triggered in me. My children are around me. Um, how do I behave when I'm angry? How do I behave gently if, you know, those incredibly strong emotions come up in me? What would be um, your suggestions? Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. And I think every parent is has been in that place, right, where something that our children are doing hits us in a way that really sets off whether it's a trigger ourselves for something we experienced when we were children, or it's something that just makes us really angry. They broke something or they've been on our nerves all day. And, and now this was the final 172nd time they did something you asked them not to do. Um, and I think the first thing that you said is key is to recognize your own anger. That if, if we can even have that glimmer of realization that, ooh, I am triggered right now. Like I am angry. I am, and even um, sensing into our own physical response, um, the community resiliency model that we teach talks a lot about sensing our own physical reactions to stress or anger. I'm feeling really hot in my chest, or I'm noticing that I am clenching my fists, or my head feels like it's about to explode, or I'm hearing ringing in my ears. Whatever it is, whatever our body is physically doing in that moment, the more we can do to recognize that, first of all, and then work on some of those skills to what, what we say is someone when that happens, that someone has been bumped out of their resilient zone. We, we all function in this zone where you can be angry, you can be angry or sad or happy, you know, have all these emotions, but you're in control. But when we get bumped out, whether we're bumped out high, where we're physically um, have this high energy, um, sort of aggressive, lots of energy reaction, or you can get bumped low where you um, withdraw and be, go into a depressive state. Which, whichever you are, the, the faster you learn how to bring yourself back into that resilient zone, the better off we are to be able to move through life when bad things happen or when things are really frustrating. Frustrating. Um, and we have lots of, um, we, we do workshops on, on how to do that, but we have um, what we call 10 help now skills. Like when we're on the edge, like I'm, you know, we've all been there, right? Like on the edge of that cliff and I'm going to throw this glass or I, you know, and, and we know we're right there and it's really hard to be at that place. And um, drawing on, so first of all, recognizing I'm, I'm here, I'm at the cliff. Um, and then second, then to use some of these skills um, to bring yourself back in what we, we say, we use the term a rapid reset, reset our body's um, uh, stress response to that, into that resilient zone. Um, and they're really, some of these are very, very simple things we can do. And actually, before I talk about some of those, I, I'd, I'd like to say, um, just like a, an athlete trains to, to be a fast runner or a high jumper or a great tennis player, these are things that take lots of practice. And, and we, we need to practice these resilient skills um, of bringing us back to the, that place where we're, we can step back from that cliff. Um, and and I, you know, I'd love for you all to maybe someday you could have um, one of our CRIM trainers talk about what some of those are on one of your podcasts. Um, but rapid reset. So there's 10 help now skills and I can share the link for that 
with you all, but some of those are things like um, de- taking a, a cool glass of water. It sounds like so like a no brainer, you know, but when you actually, when you get take a cold glass of water and take a few sips of that and really sense into your body senses, how, what does this taste like? Let me feel that cold water going down my throat. Let me feel this cold glass in my hand and swallow. We are moving, we're rewiring our brain from that really angry at the cliff place to a place where we're thinking about something else. We're moving away from that angry place in our brain to think about something else, even just for a few seconds. And it it can take us away from that cliff. Would you mind explaining what creme means to the audience? Who used to sure, sorry. Sure. Um, creme, uh, the letter C-R-M, stands for Community Resilience Model. And it was developed by a woman named Elaine miller Karras, who runs an organization called uh, Trauma Resource Institute in California. And we have trained um, about 30 individuals in New Hanover County to be trainers in that model. And we're doing some education in the community, in schools, with families, churches, to teach these skills because like, you don't have to be a clinical social worker to know that getting a cool glass of water, if I tell this to my neighbor who's having a really rough day, um, it's a very um, lay person, skill that we can help one another with and help our community become more resilient. And let me just give you one more, um, just so there's, we can talk about two of the 10. Uh, Another one is to um, name the colors of the rainbow in your room. So can you, can you find, and these are great things to teach your children too, when they, because they get, they, this happens to them too, right? They, which is oftentimes how we end up on the cliff is when our kids are right at that cliff. Mm-hmm. Um, so naming the the seven colors of the rainbow. Have you found anything red? I'm sort of looking around my room like, I really don't have, there. Oh, there's something on the salt shaker that's red. Right? So I had to look and I am completely not thinking about anything else other than looking for something red. And it takes my brain from someplace else to just this task and I get to move away from that trauma brain. And then we can see more in this moment, we are safe. Mm -hmm. Trauma isn't happening in front of us. Um, Yeah. I love that rainbow. Um, Just even thinking about a rainbow brings a smile to my face before I even do the exercise. Yeah. Um, What great techniques. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Marisol, did you have any other questions that you wanted to? Um... Well, I just, um, I had two, actually. <laughs> One is, you know, because listening, and again, I'm a layman, have no, no um, uh, therapeutic training at all, just as a student <laughs> or a user of it. Um, but, it, you know, repeating back what I think I've heard is, you know, that it sort of, Nancy, it reminds me the way you described it, I think in season one about like hopping on one leg, like, you know, I'm, you, you're deregulated because you've been triggered. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love how the modalities, all the different ones all kind of boil down to these simple, you know, it sound, I know it sounds simple and it's harder in practice and especially hard at the moment, but it is something that the data is showing that is possible for all of us to do, which is to get back into, you know, our bodies in that moment and, and you know, not let our reptile brain um, act out. So I love that. So my question is, um, what if, the children aren't being gentle with us. Like, like how do we teach our children to be gentle? How do we teach them to behave? I'm assuming step one would be in our own behavior, modeling it. But let's say that cat's out of the bag and it's a new practice and you're, you're practicing um, behaving gently and not, you know, um, in my case, let's say flipping out. How do we mm-hmm. teach the kids? Like, I know we have different age groups and so on, so maybe we have to speak to different 
ages, but how do we teach our children to be gentle? So it, it's sort of like um, uh, uh, building blocks, right? So we can't do this in one afternoon um, and we can't do it in, in one lesson. And I think some of um, what's really important is all along how important it is for us to teach our children empathy. I, I wonder how that little, if you run into someone in a, a line at the grocery store who's um, having a tantrum and you're with your child, I wonder how that little boy's feeling right now. He looks like he's really frustrated. Or I wonder how um, that um, little little girl is feeling, she's crying, look at the tears on her face. You know, the more we can do to teach our children about feelings, you know, giving them words for feelings, giving them um, opportunities to see how other people are feeling. Um, mommy is feeling really frustrated right now. And it's good for them to sort of learn that when you're not in that hot moment with them. To, to take opportunities to say, um, well, I'm feeling really excited right now because I get to have my favorite dessert tonight, or I'm feeling really sad today because I only got to talk to grandma for a few minutes and I really had a lot to say. So just sort of teaching those um, feeling skills, naming those emotions. Um, so again, that's sort of the building blocks to get to where you are when your children maybe are, are grabbing you or biting you or um, physically hurting you. Um, it's at that point when hopefully you can use those tools that you've learned to say, right now you are hurting me. And, and this feels, this makes me feel very sad. This makes me feel angry. Um, and again, like you said, Marcel, you know, um, modeling that behavior to um, to not let their anger, their not being gentle, trigger you to go to that other place where you know. And I, and I'm saying you, but it's 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 us. It's all of us who are you know. This happens to every parent. Um, some so can, more than others, but <laughs> you're welcome to say me because I, <laughs> I happily admit when um, I, you know, I think that's a wonderful way to segue into something that Nancy and I generally say in almost all our podcasts, which is if the content of this episode is bringing up for any of our listeners, you know, concern, shame, embarrassment, you're role playing or rolodexing in your head every moment that you did not behave gently, you know, to have grace for yourself because even just listening to this episode and digesting this information, you know, you're taking a step in the right direction with your intention. So. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I would add to then model what we want our children to do when they um, don't behave the way they want to. Right. So we would have that awareness, calm ourselves down, Gently go to our child and own what we weren't pleased with how we behaved and just say, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry that I screamed at you or whatever we did. Um, I was feeling really sad or hurt or scared, um, but you didn't deserve my, um, you know, my screaming. And so because that's what we want to teach our children to do, too. And um, it's a beautiful lesson. For, for everybody, that we're all going to make mistakes, but it's what do you do after that? We all have our moments in life, don't we? Especially now. Yes. Um, is there anything else that we didn't address? I'm, again, I know I, I would love to have you on every week to, to, to hear more about this. is so important. Um, but is there anything else today that, that you would like to um, share? I just have one statement um, that I wanted to share. Um, this comes from Dr. Jack, Jack Shonkoff, who is a, um, a, a doctor with um, the Harvard Center for um, the Developing Brain. And we, this came up earlier when we were talking, and, and he's, one of you said something about you might not remember, but, um, but it's still there or something like that. And, and what he says is, the mind may not remember, 
but the body remembers. And how we've talked a lot today about how connected the body is to our mind. And, and so really learning what happens in our bodies and what's happening in our children's bodies when we have strong emotions and we can learn a lot from, from that. So I think that's a, a big part of what we're trying to do in the community. Mm, I love that. I, um, I, I can't thank you enough for everything you do every day to help children and parents and, and really all, all of us um, behave in a way that, that takes better care of ourselves and also of our relationships and society in general. So thank you so much for your time, your expertise, um, your heart. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please follow us on social media, rate, review, and subscribe. All these things do help us share the Be the Adult message. We truly appreciate it, and we will see you next Sunday. Bye.